Hi listeners, it's Tim here. And just before we get started with today's episode, I wanted to let you know about an exciting new development here at Top Music. And that's the launch of our brand new Guitar Teachers program, which is happening in October 2021. Building on our experience helping piano teachers have more fun, achieve more success and feel more confident in both their teaching and business, we'll soon be opening the doors to do the same for the world's guitar teachers. So if you or someone you know is a guitar teacher of any level or ability, please head to topmusic.co slash stay tuned so that we can let you know all the details when we go live. That's topmusic.co slash stay tuned. That's all one word. Okay, let's get on with today's show. You know, I used to be, how many pieces can I teach my student today? How much theory can we finish? Um, you know, are they memorizing pieces? Are they going towards this contest or that exam and this? You know, having that list. Now, it doesn't mean that my studio is Lucy goosey you know, or anything goes. It's not really anything goes, but it's, it's, there is a framework of what I'm working with. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the TopCast, your home for inspiration, ideas, business, and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. My name is Nicole Douglas, your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, thank you so much for tuning in. You're listening to episode 263. Here's a special welcome to my Top Music Pro teachers. Today's show notes are now available at topmusic.co slash episode 263. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how stress and trauma can affect the brain and how we relate to other people. While we're not therapists by any means, we can benefit from learning how to use therapeutic techniques to help calm our own brains and our students' brains so that learning can take place. This research as it relates to music teaching is so new that it often receives a lot of pushback because the cultural thinking has been that science and psychology don't have a place in studying music, that studying scientific principles may hamper our ability to feel expressive in our music. If the brain manages our thoughts and emotions, and those thoughts and emotions trigger physical responses, then better understanding how these things interact will only unlock our expressive potential. I've seen it happen in my own studio. There are simple strategies we can quickly employ in our lessons to help students deal with frustration and overwhelm and even rude behavior, and also help us when we feel frustrated and overwhelmed. I'm so excited for today's episode. Hello, TopCast listeners. We're excited to have Gloria Tam Paines with us today. And my name is Nicole Douglas, and I'll just let you know that I met Gloria at a conference a couple of years ago, and we just totally hit it off uh, with my research that I had done for the injury prevention program I was in and studying how the brain works and then finding out that she had learned so much about how the brain works in children and how we can better reach our students We just really hit it off. I'm so excited about her research and her training that she's gone through. And uh, so, Gloria, we're excited to have you here. Since this is your first time on the podcast, can you give us a little background of what your story is? Thank you, Nicole. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be interviewed by Top Music. I'll start by saying that I'm from Malaysia originally and have been in the United States for more than 20 years. So I've lived more than half my life here. And I started uh, learning piano when I was five and continued on for my undergraduate and my master's degree and later also Mm -hmm. a doctorate. So very familiar with ADRSM. Um, and Trinity College and so a very traditional um, learning the nice thing is I did play by ear uh, as a child so that was the fun part that I could do a lot of other things Mm -hmm. wonderful okay so I've invited you here today because I was so enamored with your research on trauma and trauma-informed teaching and um So can you give us a little bit of your story of how you came into finding out about this and what led you to become a certified TBRI? um, Yeah, trust-based relational intervention practitioner. So in the... A couple years ago, I um, stumbled upon this huge field of uh, trauma-informed care, not by choice, but by necessity. I had a difficult pregnancy. I know it might be too much information for people. Um, but We're all real and here. Then a diff- <laughs> yeah, and a difficult birth resulting in my child being in the NICU for 12 days. 
So all that, um, you know, when you do not realize that whole bundle is a form of trauma, you wouldn't seek help. So, but when you've had a traumatic experience, it affects everybody around you, even though you do not realize it at that time. So when my child became a toddler, they do grow up. (laughs) The terrible twos were not just terrible twos. They were pretty intense. So that's when I realized that my skill set as a person and as a mom, I really needed help. My skill set was lacking. So Mm -hmm. I found myself uh, looking for a child therapist and looking for, for some answers as to why there was some very baffling behaviors that we were seeing. And I came across a a radio program and Dr. Karen Purvis, the late Dr. Karen Purvis, um, this was a recorded interview, was an archive interview, and she listed the six main areas of early childhood trauma. And when she listed six of those, I could check mark five out of the six. So that started my journey into looking for a therapist that was trained by her. And I did find one within the week, thankfully. And so began my journey into learning how trauma affects the brain, how trauma affects a child's development, and how trauma affects adults and how adults uh, respond to trauma. And obviously, in this short amount of time, we cannot cover every aspect of trauma. For sure. Mm -hmm. But. I think it is uh, important for us as teachers and as people just to be trauma aware. And uh, I know it's been said a lot in the last two years and nobody ever wants to hear the words unprecedented or pandemic uh, ever again. My goodness, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are coming out of this unprecedented pandemic I'll say it Uh, and you can scream in the background it's okay Um, (laughs) and um, we're finding that students are going to display some behaviors that we might not be familiar with or we have never seen before and that is categorized under trauma response and how we as teachers can respond um, gives us a framework for a relationship and also how to move forward. I, I believe we have to move forward together. It's an individual journey, but we have to do it together. Um, so this is how I found out about uh, trauma-informed care and trauma-informed pedagogy. And I think it's probably the biggest and most important tool in my toolbox now. I would say that it has totally changed my outlook as a person, as a mom, as a teacher, as a pianist. So I'm just glad to be able to talk a little bit about it today. Thank you. I'm I'm glad to have you here. So for those who aren't familiar with trauma-informed teaching or trauma in general, Could you give us a couple of uh, behaviors or examples of what we might see in our studios that may be related to trauma? Yeah. So the the first thing I wanted to clarify is trauma-informed pedagogy is not a set of rules. It's not a set of, you know, do this and you will get this and do that, you will get that. It doesn't really work that way. So for some of us who are type A and really just want a list of what to do, I hate to disappoint you (laughs) Um, because trauma-informed pedagogy is understanding the impact of traumatic stress on cognitive processes and behavior, uh, social emotional skills. That is what trauma-informed pedagogy really is. And as a teacher, it is a purposeful creation of safe spaces for students and also using empowerment principles and engaging with students on a relational level 
It is also adaptive. That's the key word. It is adaptive. It's always mm-hmm. fluid. Because from week to week, you might need to change what you are doing in response to what the student is doing. And uh, it also is about student-centered learning and helping the student have self-efficacy, just moving onwards by themselves. Um, So that is a good definition. So it is a working understanding because it's constantly changing. This field is so new that there's barely much published, especially for the music world. Now, there's a lot of information out for public education, but even then, it's very limited um, on how music teachers can adapt it to their classrooms. So, Behaviors, baffling behaviors. Um, So if you can look at the list of behaviors or symptoms for post-traumatic stress disorder, you'd find that because the brain is easily triggered into fight or flight or freeze. So you get some baffling behaviors that will happen. So anger, a student who is very angry or a student that shuts down easily, um, a student doesn't respond to a new piece for example if you say hey let's learn a new piece today and you find that that student totally shuts down so their window of tolerance might be fairly small being impatient Mm -hmm. or being impulsive all those anxiety behaviors um depression so it's really a huge ball um, that we're being handed, (laughs) to say the least. Um, So if you are working with um, students, you you are just going to get a wide array of how a person is responding to to trauma around them. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I think what can feel overwhelming is that we are not trained as music teachers. That's not part of our curriculum in college or even when Mm -hmm. we're growing up to learn um, about all these social emotional issues. And um, it can feel like we're supposed to start being a counselor, which we're not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were trying to write that line of, we're not diagnosing for sure. We are not professionals, but being aware of these things can help us learn how to not only help our students turn their brains on to learn, but also I find too, from what I've learned so far is it helps keep my brain on. Um, Yes. Yeah. Cause sometimes I'll react like I'll get angry when a student gets angry. I I won't display it, but I will feel, feel it. Yes. 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 And we have to learn as teachers how to keep those feelings in check so that uh, we can, yeah, keep Mm -hmm. their, their brain on and our brain on. Yeah. So I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think the biggest pushback that we get, as I would say we, because as a trust-based relational intervention practitioner and as someone who can train other teachers for this, the biggest pushback is, is hearing a teacher say, I'm not a therapist. Mm-hmm. And it is true. We, we are not doing therapy. Um, trauma-informed care is a model of caregiving. So it is just taking care of a person from day to day. And because a therapist cannot be with that person 24 seven and at school. um, So we're learning these therapeutic techniques. So we're not doing therapy, but we're using therapeutic techniques to keep our classrooms going, to keep our studios moving forward. And I think that is the key. That is the difference. You know, I'm definitely not going to be the one who says, you know, that that student needs medication or that student needs, you know, but I can observe some things. I can observe and say and talk to the parent and say, hey, you know, we might need to consider doing this. And as I have begun my journey with um, this trauma-informed care, I have been able to uh, size up a student fairly quickly as far as their sensory needs, as far as um, their window of tolerance. 
you know, how, how well do they respond to a challenge um, and how much challenge can I give them? And I think one of the other pushback is if I do this, am I coddling the student? Am I enabling the student to, you know, let's say prolong their temper tantrum? Am I just giving in to them? I would, mm -hmm. here is a good way to think about it. If trauma affects the brain and they are stuck in the limbic brain where all the emotions are firing, if we can teach the child something to regulate or co-regulate uh, with them, their emotions, and help them engage their cognitive brain again, that is a win. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, you find that a student becomes very argumentative. So verbally, they are very aggressive verbally. That is actually a good sign. <laughs> I've had mm -hmm. to learn that. I've really had to learn that, that um, because it's a trigger for me when a student's being rude uh, verbally. But when I study the research, you would prefer a student to be verbally aggressive than physically aggressive. <laughs> Yes. Than, someone oh who's, than someone who's just folding their hands and not talking to you at all. That is, um, in fact, some of the, some of in our, in my training a session, there were um, what I would call juvenile detention officers uh, who were sitting in as a part of this training. And it, they have been running the, the research uh, in their facility as well. And they, they said, when they implemented trauma-informed care, the number of incidents where physical fighting or physical altercations were involved dropped significantly. But verbal arguments, name-calling, you know, using bad words, um, you know, yelling at an officer, all those incidents in increased. It was a great increase. And wow. after that, they said, a month or two later, those incidents began to decrease as well. Mm -hmm. wow. So they do have, you know, they, they are tracking this research. So I would um, encourage teachers in the classroom just to hold back, just to hold back from dismissing a student from their studio just because they were rude verbally. It is, it takes a lot. Of, of time. It takes a lot of years to learn to use our words effectively. You can see that in adult arguments too. But, yeah, because when they start using words, they're actually engaging their cognitive brain. You know, they're trying mm -hmm. to get there. They're really trying to get there. Yes. So, so that is one, uh, one thing I would say. If if you're getting a student that started off very quiet, they ignore you, and all of a sudden you're getting these, you know, sassy, you know, remarks from that student, consider that an improvement. We're moving. Wow. We're moving. You know, that train is moving. Now you can begin a relationship. You know, mm -hmm. it might be uh, a little fragile, a little difficult, but there is, there is room to talk now. So that gives you a glimpse of how trauma-informed pedagogy views misbehavior. We, we view it from that lens instead of, I need to punish this behavior and I need it to stop. It's more of, yes, I do need this behavior to stop, but what is this behavior telling me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it informing me about this student that I can engage, that I can correct, and I can turn the ship? So that is wow. how it works. I think that is a good, most of us will not get a student who would be physically aggressive because, you know, usually by the time they arrive in our studios, most things have been taken care of, but you're going to get some verbal Definitely some verbal stuff. Um, that would not be unusual. So, yeah, I'm yeah. so glad you mentioned the word informed on the teacher side. I had always viewed it as I need to get informed about trauma. Um, mm -hmm. but, but from the student side, it's informing us 
about where our students are coming from. That, yeah, yeah this is a whole new, I hadn't thought of it before that way, that we are <laughs> gathering information uh, from our students to interpret what they're thinking because they aren't very good at using words sometimes. Mm-hmm. Wow. I love yeah. that. And, uh, and I think for us, um, for me, like I mentioned, you know, I had a very traditional upbringing, a very traditional track to being a pianist, being um, finishing my doctorate. But in the last, I think I would say four years, I really had to make a very conscious decision to change. Mm-hmm. Um, I like what my child therapist said. You can change. You are able to change. You know, there are skills um, that you can acquire, that you can practice, just like you acquired your piano skills. You can acquire this set of skills. And she said this, and I keep it, I keep it in my mind. She said, you can learn to swim quickly <laughs> as a teacher. You can learn to swim really well. And the students will start swimming with you because you are swimming. But you can choose to sink. You can choose to not learn these. And the sad thing is they will sink with you. Um, wow, that's really powerful. Said, you can learn to swim. She's like, you know, and the better you swim, the more students will follow. They will just float. There was, you know, they might not swim as well as you, but they will, they will start following you. But if you sink, then there is nothing. So that was a good wake-up call um, for me that, hey, I, I can learn these skills. Mm-hmm. So here's yeah, an example. Goes, uh-huh. yes. can, I just want to say ahead. one quick thing. This hmm. goes right along with the child development theory of children behave when they can. That usually yes. misbehavior is information that something isn't right and that if they're limbic brain was taken care of and their cognitive brain was active, they, they it would just behave in a way that would be more yes. um, relational. It's like we would we'd get along better. <laughs> yes. So I think um, the same grace we can extend to ourselves um, is the same grace we can extend to others. Um, you know, I think for me, when I want to put myself, you know, I want to be vulnerable here too, because trauma um, affects everybody. It it does. And for me, I learned when I was working with the therapist, how much trauma I I actually carried. (laughs) I, she looked at me and she said, you don't see yourself as a person who has a lot of trauma. I said, I don't. So As a person who carries a lot of trauma, we tend to not think about it or not talk about it and push it aside. And as I worked with uh, this child therapist, I found out that I carried a lot of trauma. The questionnaires that we were doing, the intake questionnaires, and she asked me, do you realize how much trauma you carry, you have carried? And I told her, no, I really don't feel it. I don't see myself that way. And she told me that is the typical response (laughs) of a person who has a lot of trauma. I was shocked. And she also said, and as we work to narrow that gap, you know, to really come to terms with what has happened in the past, the person becomes more and more whole. You know, you, you love yourself a little bit more. <laughs> you give yourself grace a little bit more. And I noticed that some days when I am just wake up frustrated for no reason, I'm sure some listeners can agree with this or can relate to this. You just can't snap out of that mood, no matter what you try. There is that helpless feeling of, I really don't want to be so moody today. I want to feel happy. I want to feel satisfied. I want to be pleased with the world, but I just can't. I want you to place that in a child, that same feeling. They do not have our verbal uh, capabilities. They do not have our cognitive uh, capabilities. Wow. 
so explosive temper tantrums, <laughs> yes. explosive. Um, and so we see that. So I think as teachers, we do want, want to, you know, that behavior isn't acceptable. It's true. Even the therapist would say, yes, it isn't acceptable. There are better ways to express our frustration. And as an adult, I've had to learn that. So that's a child. Um, so mm -hmm. that is what I my goal is in, in my studio now. So I wanted to mention how I changed my, my studio. Yes, and I remember very, when I heard your yes. <laughs> presentation at NCKP, like it was yes. so much fun. You brought so many props and I left yes. thinking like, oh my gosh, I want to be a student in her studio. <laughs> yes, and I think the biggest thing was I sat down and thought about how am I going to frame all these into my teaching philosophy now? Because, you know, I used to be, how many pieces can I teach my student today? How much theory can we finish? Um, you know, are they memorizing pieces? Are they going towards this contest or that exam and this? You know, having that list. Now, it doesn't mean that my studio is loosey-goosey, you know, or anything goes. It's not really anything goes, but it's, it's, there is a framework of what I'm working with. So how I evaluate a lesson, yeah, is mm -hmm. how did I connect with my student today? So connection. Did we engage and build trust with one another? Am I learning to trust the student a little bit more? And is the student learning to trust me a little bit more? Is the teacher-student relationship stronger? Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom is what musical concepts and activities did we accomplish today? And I find that with this paradigm shift, I am actually able to do more. Um, I'm able to teach more pieces. We do the repertoire challenge. Some of my students do 60 pieces a year. Some students pursue ABRSM. Some students pursue RCM exams. And so I am still able to do all that, but there's a framework for me and a framework for the student. Mm -hmm. There's always an out. Mm -hmm. can, can you say and, a little bit uh, about why that would be that you're able to teach more when you do this? I think one of the thing is if you are able to switch off some of that limbic brain activity, <laughs> like being mm -hmm. too nervous, being, um, and, and I think students can sense if you're, you're on the edge, you know, they can sense it. You don't need to say anything. Your body language will tell a lot. And mm -hmm. so playful interaction. Um, I had a student, I had a new student who, um, who just started with me this semester and he was playing a, a, you know, a piece that was a little difficult for him. He had a hard time keeping a steady tempo. So he started the piece and I told him to keep playing. And I said, I'm going to, and I stepped out of the, my studio to go get my cup of tea. And then I came back in as he finished the piece and I told him, Hey, you played really well. You know, you played mm -hmm. really well. And, um, you know, you kept a steady tempo. All the things we talked about, you did really well. And I said, you know, I used to not step out of the studio when, um, you know, the lesson has started. Even if I left my cup of tea in the kitchen, I would just leave it there. And I told him that, you know, I've learned when I step out of my studio, students tend to play better. So I didn't hurry. <laughs> I said, I didn't hurry to come back to you. And I heard the whole piece from the kitchen and you played a whole lot better just by that simple admission of what I was doing. Oh, he had a big smile on his face. <laughs> you know, he just went like, I said, I, and I told him, I said, I knew you would play a lot better if I wasn't in the room. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear you from the hallway. And I said, and it's true. It's always true. You know, so that yeah, puts I have to tell my students. Ease. 
Yeah, I have to tell my students too that, uh, you know, my piano is different than your piano. Every piano feels a little different. And, yes. you know, you don't get to practice on this piano. So it feels mm-hmm. different when you're in my house. So yes. it's okay if you feel a little bit nervous. And sometimes yes. I get nervous too. <laughs> Yes, yes. And so that is, you know, uh, so I told him, you know, that was one strategy of building connection. And I told him, you know, I used to be worried, you know, what a student would think of me when if I left the room to get a drink, you know, I and he was just like, yeah, you know, I, I can see why you you would be worried, you know, and and at the same time, acknowledging that, yes, you are a little on the edge when I'm sitting here listening to you. So that was just a simple, you know, attunement that is really an attunement exercise and being showing him that I was aware of my emotional and physiological state. I, I knew I was just like, you know, I'm not super comfortable walking out of the room when, when you are playing, but I did that anyway. And you are not super comfortable playing in front of me, but you did that anyway. So look at the two of us, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, that puts us on, you know, in in a way, in a way we are uh, communicating, you know, things that are felt. And so when I give a student a challenge, they are more um, able to think about that. I know, I, I, I know, I understand what's going on. And so instead of me trying to teach, I tend to frame it as, let me help you with doing this. Let me help you with learning this new thing. Um, let's try and break it down together. And so that is uh, something I do with, I know you wanted me to, uh, I know in the NCKP presentation, you saw all the props and all the sensory things mm-hmm. um, that I brought. Yes. Now, and if you have to, anything yes. you do want us to share, we can link it in the show notes. So we can put a link to uh-huh. an overview video if you wanted to share that or a, a website with more ideas. Yeah. I or, can, yeah. So I, uh, yes. So I have students, and I'm sure you do too, that cannot keep their hands still. And if they sit on your bench, they'll start rocking back and forth. Um, mm-hmm. I've had two students in the last year hit their heads on the lid of my piano because <laughs> they were rocking so badly. I mean, this year has been a real learning curve for me too. Um, for the first time, I had a student fall off the bench and mm-hmm. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, shocked. But at the same time, I could see it coming um, based on the sensory needs of this child. Mm-hmm. So with this student, we spent a lot of time on the floor. Um, we sometimes roll, he would sometimes roll on the floor as part of his movement activity. And so being aware of a sensor, the students who need sensory input, um, this particular student always comes in with a soft toy, always comes in with a stuffed animal of some sort. And you might think he's a child that is old enough and does not need any of that anymore. Um, I witnessed this um, with his parents. His parents said, don't take that toy into your piano lesson because it's just going to distract you. Mm -hmm. Leave it in the car. And instantly the child started crying. It -hmm. was an instant crying. And I had to, it's difficult to navigate with parents. I would say that is something you just have to learn. And I told the parent, I said, it's okay. He can, he can bring the toy in. We'll navigate that in the studio. So he just brought the toy in and it's something he plays. Um, you know, when I'm talking, he plays with that toy mm-hmm. and I do not see that as disrespectful behavior. I see that as a sensory need. If I take the toy away, he's going to be thinking about that toy the whole time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but sure. if he keeps the toy in his hands, he's able to pay attention to me. Um, mm-hmm. And if I ask him, what did I tell you? Can you explain to me what I just said? He can. So that is something that is actually regulating his brain. Now, as he grows a little older, I'm sure it will not be a stuffed animal. He's going to be playing, always be playing with something in his hands. And that is a sensory seeker. So I have a box of sensory toys in my studio. 
all sorts of fidgets. You can get these for, uh, they're fairly inexpensive. So I would say yes. If you can say yes to that, go ahead. It doesn't really take much for you to make that concession or that adaptation in your teaching. So mm -hmm. I think another, ups, yes. another great thing about that is that it's, if you view it as the, the student bringing a part of themselves into your studio, yes, they're trusting you to meet their favorite stuffed animal. And that yes. can be a great way to have a conversation. And even if they don't want to let go of it, sometimes like if I can get them to be ready to say, okay, I'll put it on the edge of the piano and we're going to play this yes. song for this stuffed animal. Then it becomes part of the lesson. It really helps Absolutely. them open up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if a child brings um, a stuffed animal or things like that, if you have a grand piano, let them set it on top um, where it's where they can see it right on the music uh, rack. Um, and on my upright, they just set it next to them on the bench. And sometimes we'll use it in our rhythm activity. If we can, we'll just uh, incorporate that into the lesson. So floor spots. I have a trampoline. I have a mini trampoline and I love it. I wish my studio has space to put it right in the studio. But I have students who do ask to go jump on it prior to their lesson. And I do let them. One of the um, occupational therapy books that I have read says that jumping, especially when there's pressure like that, when there is uh, resistance, it stimulates the area of the brain for reading. So what, a, you know, wow. we talk about music literacy all the time. What a better, that's a great exercise for them. Um, body sock. I've had students who would put themselves in a body sock and just um, work all those muscles. And I you find that there are children that do not have a concept of personal space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they will come very, very close to you. I'm sure COVID makes it so hard for them, their social distancing. And mm. body socks are a great way of teaching, um, you know, social, uh, this, what is an appropriate distance of personal space, personal bubble. Um, mm -hmm. Also, so for you can... Yes. <laughs> For those not familiar with a body sock, it's it's an actual like a pillowcase that they put all themselves in except for their head. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And they can push their arms and legs against that uh, body sock. It's pretty cool. I, I think I'll send a link of some of these to you so people can Wonderful. see what they are. Okay. Um, one other <laughs> thing, um, if your older, your older students might not you know, want all these things. But if a student comes in who's already chewing gum, I don't ask them to spit it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, chewing gum and bubble gum is a good, quick way for sensory input. It keeps the body at a rest and relaxed state because you have to, you know, suck, swallow, chew, um, <laughs> you know, and breathe obviously yeah. so that is a great regulation tool and sometimes I find myself doing that now more often just to keep myself regulated as well so bubble gum chewing mm -hmm. gum yeah just you know say yes to that it will make your life easier <laughs> <laughs> now um, with that you can still set rules about not touching it in your hands yes, or anything not yes playing with the chewing gum yes, yes. absolutely absolutely so all these there are lots of simple simple things um and the biggest thing is for teachers is how aware are you of yourself? You know, I think mm -hmm. um, I don't want to sound like a therapist because I'm not one, but I think a lot of how, you know, if we can sit back and ask ourselves why, for example, if I meet you and you say, no, I don't allow candy in the studio why <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. really ask yourself why it's just a, it, you know I know I don't want to I don't want sticky keys obviously you know I don't want that but mm. you know if you say you don't allow chewing gum in your studio I would ask you why and if you say that oh that is just disrespectful I will keep asking you why <laughs> you know what was taught to you what is the sacred cow you're holding on to 
And especially in the college studio. Now, I used to teach class piano in the university. And there was one class that a tornado warning happened right before my class. So we had spent an hour in the basement. And then here we are at 10 o'clock trying to start our class. Everybody's frazzled. The students are just, you know, everybody's talking about this tornado warning. And what I did that day was I asked one of the students, anybody have chewing gum, you know? And someone said, yeah, we do. I said, everybody take out a piece of gum and start chewing. And here's your assignment. I'd like for you to review what page, what page. It was almost in two minutes, I had a working class. Everybody was focused. I could see calm breathing. It was very interesting. I mean, Mm. I could have just told everybody to calm down, you know, and the tornado warnings over. It was, you know, a false alarm for us. But that wouldn't have really worked. Uh Sometimes when we hear adults say, calm down, there's nothing to be worried about. We get more anxious. Yes. And it really is. uh, Yeah. It's got to be real careful with that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So being aware of what we say no to informs ourselves a lot about us, you know, and how our attachment styles are. I know we don't have time to talk about attachment styles, Mm -hmm. but how we relate to other people shows our attachment styles. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes we were raised to be dismissive. And that means I don't have space for your emotional state. (laughs) If you're mad, Perhaps you should just go to another room and be mad. And when you're not mad, come back out. Or, oh, you're sad. You've lost someone. I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. And, but I can't stand you crying in front of me. So I really have to excuse myself. You see, all this, you know, we were taught a lot of these. We, we were mm-hmm. unconsciously taught a lot of this. And I know your podcast is all over the world, uh, broadcast all over the world. But in the U.S., the statistics are 70% of adults are dismissive in attachment styles. That is, yeah, 70%. It's a high percentage. So there's about 10% who are secure. You know, they're secure enough to to handle other people's uh, negative emotions. That's another 10% who are the people pleasers, the ambivalent. And I will admit, I'm a recovering ambivalent, a recovering perfectionist. So Mm -hmm. I'm in that. (laughs) That means I try to say yes to everything. I try to do more than I need to need to do. And so for me, I have to pull back. I have to learn to hold my boundaries. And Mm -hmm. for the dismissives, they need to step out of their box a little bit more. The good news is in um, attachment theory, there is always room to grow. We we never stop growing. So we can choose to be uh, more and more secure. They call it earn the secure. We can just grow into that. And so... I give myself grace on days where, you know, hey, I did too much again. I stepped over that boundary. And I will just tell myself tomorrow's a new day and I'll just try again. And Mm -hmm. someday it will get better. So that is for for teachers to know in this uh, trauma-informed framework, it is an invitation to grow, to grow as a person. um, And it's okay to not know It's okay to not be able to solve the world's problems for child hunger or child abuse, but you have one child, one student, one colleague in front of you, and you start with that person, and it doesn't seem so daunting anymore. That's beautiful. Wow. Mm -hmm. I love that. So one thing you said in the middle of our interview was talking about how it can be difficult to work with parents, but then you also mentioned how therapists are only with those students uh, or their, their, their children, the children that they're working with for a very short time amount of week. Maybe they go once or twice a week. You know, Mm -hmm. we're only with children for 30 to 45 minutes or once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. So 
it, it, there's just no way that as piano teachers or music teachers that we can make a difference without working together with the parents and without working together with the therapist and the music, uh, the, you know, their school teachers. Yes. And it mm-hmm. seems like if we all became more informed about how our children are feeling and learning how to help them develop the skills to manage their feelings mm-hmm. that like we're all going to rise up together. Yes. I like I really like that quote you said about the swimming that yes. we're swimming together or sinking together. Yes. This is and not a competition between mm-hmm. parents and teachers. We are no. all together or we're all sinking together. No. Um it, yeah, we're not in competition. And so in my studio, I do I mean some some students uh, and their parents have told me what they're struggling with. And so I do ask uh, uh, them and to sign a release. And I said, I'd be happy to um, do whatever your therapist recommends, um, especially the ones who are working with uh, occupational therapy, in occupational therapy, or with a uh, parent-child interaction, tra- uh, interactive therapy. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I tell them I'm happy to use the same phrases because there are scripts that they learn. Um, I said, I'm happy to use those in the studio because it just reinforces what they are learning um, to do in therapy. So again, I'm not the therapist, but I want to continue the therapeutic work that is happening outside yes. outside the therapy session. Of course, sometimes you will get a child that a uh, student that will unpack their you know their trauma history in your studio. I've had that happen, and it is overwhelming. It is very overwhelming because I'm not a therapist, and I remember walking out of that lesson going. This is why I am not a therapist. This is why I'm a trauma-informed teacher. Because I could stay there and hold space. That was all I was doing, was I was holding space for this student to tell me about his trauma history. And, And my response that day, my response that day would determine whether or not this student will share with another adult his trauma history. Now, if I reacted badly, that would not have been good. That would, if I started crying, which some people would, that would actually re-traumatize that student. You know, even though you say I'm, portray- I'm, I'm showing him empathy, yes, but in a, you have to show empathy in a way that does not re-traumatize the student. And so I I would say I kept really calm and took me all the energy I could to stay very calm um, for him not to trigger my trauma history. And I thanked him. I actually asked if um, he would put his hand in mine and I put my hand palms up (laughs) so he could take his hand off my hand anytime. I did not grab his hand or anything, but I gave him my hand palms up and he put his hand in mine. And I told him, I said, I want you to look me in the eye. I said, and I told him, I am very sorry. Someone did that to you. And I said, I thank you for trusting me with what happened to you. I said, I, I, It was very brave of you to share all of that with me. And I I told him, all those things will never happen here in the studio. Okay, you have my promise. And I'm so glad you told me all of that. And you know what? He took his hand off mine and went back to happily improvising on the piano as if he never told me any of the stuff that I now have to process. And that is the power of learning these skills. I mean, if I did not have that training, I would probably have cried or Mm -hmm. told him to stop or told him, don't, I don't want to hear any of that because that's really difficult to hear. And I just was so thankful, was so thankful for the training I received, knowing how to hold the space. Now, I can unpack any of that with him. All That was all I could do was thank him 
for telling me and reassuring him that those things won't happen in the studio. And mm. really, that was all he needed to hear um, mm. was another adult can handle these big, uh, big events in his life. It doesn't scare them. It doesn't shock them. But they will keep me safe now that they know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a good way to frame uh, our conversation today. Why it is so important to have these skills as a teacher. Beautiful. Well, uh, this has been fantastic. Um, I know there's so much information that we've kind of just mm-hmm. put out there. And if people want to learn more, where do you recommend that they begin? Um, uh, there is the Texas Christian University website. It's the Karen Purvis Institute of Child Development. They do have a trauma-informed training for teachers, specifically for teachers. You can sign up for the course. I am in process of writing my my book and uh, doing hopefully in in you know in a year or two launching a course for teachers, but especially for studio teachers like you and I on how to do this. Yes. But in the meantime, um, there is a great, there's a really good book out there by Mona Della Hook called Beyond Behaviors. And I'll send all these information that uh, people can access. Uh, Steve Porges, The Pocket Guide to the Polyvagal Theory, Dan Siegel's The Whole Brain Child and No Drama Discipline. And if you really want to dig in to the world of trauma and how it affects a person, the body keeps the score. Brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma by Bessel van der Kolk is probably the gold standard for reading. Fascinating book, 400 page, uh, reads like a novel. It It was incredibly fascinating. And I'll leave you with this tidbit from the book. And with the preliminary research that uh, Basil van der Kolk and his team have done, it is that early music education for children is the best inoculation against PTSD from trauma. So, you know, so music teachers just forge on, (laughs) especially in this pandemic. You are doing something amazing for children because of the way the brain is going to be wired from music education. It allows them to bounce back faster from traumatic incidents. So, and sadly, there's not much funding in the arts for continued research, but the preliminary research is very encouraging for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Gloria, for being willing to talk with us today. And we will definitely put all those links to the books and the resources on the show notes. So be sure to check those out. And if anyone would like to learn more about you specifically, where can they learn more about you? Um, uh, They can just email me at gloria.tom at gmail.com and feel free to stop by my website, uh, musicagloriapiano.com as well. And we'll leave those in your show notes as well. Wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Gloria. You are welcome. Thank you, Nicole. We just touched the surface today. If this is a brand new topic for you and it seems overwhelming, know that you're not alone. We're all here to keep supporting each other and trying one new thing at a time. And if you're ready to learn more, I encourage you to check out the resources mentioned in the show notes. Just head over to topmusic.co. I'm Nicole Douglas, and you've been listening to the Topcast. See you next time. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio, from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas, and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.